Okay, good evening, good evening to one and all, and welcome to this evening's webinar. We're gonna have a, a packed fill. It's gonna be filled with information this evening from copyright to contract writing to intellectual property, and the list can go on. My name is Marcus Ash. I am the education officer of Pantrin Bego and the moderator for this evening's proceeding. So let me welcome every single one of you all to this uh, webinar this evening as we celebrate Steel Band Month in August. So this evening, I have two very, very special guests, two friends, two good colleagues of mine uh, joining me on this webinar to speak tonight, this evening. And the first person that I'd like to introduce here this evening is uh, a sister and a friend. She is the chief industries consultant uh, and chief connector in a big box of crayons. You'd hear more about that shortly. She's an adjunct lecturer with the Department of Creative and Festival Arts at UWE in the Arts and Cultural Enterprises Management. We know it as ACEM for those who would have passed through the CFA, postgraduate diploma. She is a director on the board of Creative TT, in which she's also the chairman of Film TT, with over 20 years experience in the creative industries from performance to legal practice to policy making and anything along that line. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome a very good sister and friend of mine, Mrs. Dion McNichol Stevenson. Dion, good evening to you. Hi, good evening, Marcus. Good evening to everyone on the live and all that will watch afterwards. It's really a pleasure to be part of our Steel Pan Month um, celebrated in August, the best month of the year. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm excited. I know you for quite some years, so I know what information you have in your head. And let me just say thanks in advance for you taking that opportunity to come here and share of your time and energy with my very own Silvan community. So the next person I only met recently, but it's not that I now know him or about him, but our partner for sure. This person here uh, has over two decades also in the music industry. Many people may know him as a guitarist playing for Etienne Charles. He would have played for many persons in and out of the steel band community, such as Zander, Johan Chakari, Ken Professor Fillmore, Bugsy, the list can go on. He did a good bit of work. When I met him, he was into Parang, and I saw him play the mandolin, and I've never heard somebody live play the mandolin to a song like that. One of the greatest this country has ever seen when it comes to the mandolin playing. He has been employed with COT, the copyright organization of Trinidad and Tobago, for over 16 years. Currently, he serves as a content coordinator on the ISRC, and he's on the ISRC management team for Trinidad and Tobago, with many webinars on copyright and intellectual property and these things behind his name. Allow me to welcome none other than Enrico Camille. Enrico? <laughs> I love that introduction. Good I am not afternoon. seeing you. I am not. Okay, I am seeing you loud and uh, <laughs> you clearly now. Yeah. Good afternoon, Marcus. Good afternoon to all my fellow musicians, arrangers, band leaders, everyone here in Trinidad and Tobago and across the world on the live. My name is Enrico Camejo. Um, after that, just recently, I was um, elected um, onto the executive of the same empath. National Power Association of Trinidad and Tobago. So, um, of course, we have a nice two years to try to build back Parang in Trinidad and Tobago where it's supposed to be. And but this is an important time uh, because with the pandemic yes. and all this is now self we definitely are. Yeah, no. uh, this pandemic has done numbers for the music industry, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the world. But that's right. that would be for another webinar that you would have. I mean, for now, <laughs> I want to say happy and month, the second best month of the year. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dion, you're muted right now, so I'm taking read. <laughs> right, but wonderful month of, of August. Welcome to this education webinar. And I'm glad to start the ball rolling. I'm going to yeah. start with the first, first topic, intellectual property, which a lot of people dwell in. They don't want to dwell in it. It confuses them. 
And I, my aim is not to confuse you anymore, but now, before you begin, Enrico, just so that I could keep everyone in the loop on what is going on, we are live on Facebook at this moment right now. We are live here right now with a lot of persons in the chat room. Uh, so we will be giving Enrico to go first, in which Dion would follow after. Right, and yes, we're going to save a section for the question and answer. So all those who have question and answers, you have two options. Uh, you can type your questions or comments in the chat wherever you're viewing us from. And once we get to the question and answer segment, we are going to get to those. And we'd also give persons the opportunity to unmute themselves and ask and have that dialogue with us as the case be as that time come. So now that all protocols has been observed, I would pass it over to you, Enrico. Take it away. Let's go into um, the presentation about copyrights yes, now. Is everyone seeing the screen? Okay, good. All right, so are you covered? And this is about copyright, about intellectual property because it's all about being covered. That is what copyright, that is what intellectual property is all about. I mean, we know the tangible things like money, like possessions, homes, cars, so. But intellectual property is just as important. In fact, it could generate even more. And so I wanna begin talking about in intellectual property, what we want to do is hone into what we are concerned about as musicians, as band players, as leaders and so forth. Because in intellectual property, there are things like patents, which I'm sure um, our next speaker will speak greatly about. There are trademarks, patents, there are geographical locations, there are inventions. There's so many different things in intellectual property. All of them can be protected because all of them are created creatives are a part of, of what creatives do sorry and um so for our purposes we are going to go into two items in the intellectual property and this particular thing which is copyright and now a new boy in the block it was always there but we consider it a new boy in the block neighboring rights so let's go let's talk about copyright first are you covered so let's see if you are covered now Every time you go to an intellectual property um, seminar or webinar, we talk about copyright basics, which as you know, this thing does, this copyright thing does run me. Everybody, no one wants to have uh, conversations about it because it baffles them. My aim is to try to unbaffle as much as Yes, message has been, this has been recorded. So this is all about trying to unravel all the little um, things that you're confused about. And if you have any questions, remember to leave it uh, for the 30 minutes at the end when we do discuss and try to answer all your questions. So here we go. You see, we start bad already. What is copyright? Copyright is a legal right created by the law of a country which grants the creator of an original work exclusive rights to its use and distribution, usually, usually for a limited time with the intent of enabling the creator, meaning like the songwriter of a musical work or the author of a book, you know, enabling them to receive compensations, royalties, for their intellectual effort. Now, what does all that jargon mean? Basically, it means that you, once you create something, and in this case, music, once you create a melody, you could write lyrics to a song. Once whatever you create, copyright grants you the right, the exclusive rights to it. Now, there's something very important about this. In order for you to be granted exclusive rights, the work must be fixed. What, is, what do I mean by the work being fixed? Let's go on and let's see. 
All right. So this is Aaron here. I tried to draw a little something here. I ain't so good in that. You know, I should somebody tell me I should take music. That's all right. This is Aaron. So Aaron thinks of a song. The song is not copyrighted. Understand this. If in the strangest of, of words, if I think of an idea and someone else thinks of an of the same idea, if that's forever possible, right? This is breaking it down to layman's terms. Whoever expresses their idea first owns the copyright of that creation. So if someone thinks of a song and he does not express it, someone, he doesn't write it down. In other words, the idea is not fixed on something, then copyright does not exist as yet. So that is the basic. So, so Aaron here, he thinks of a song and what he does, he expresses the song, right? I did not draw this. I asked permission to get this image, right? I asked permission, no question me, I asked permission. I ain't infringing on nobody right, right now. So now Aaron is like, check this out. So you see, he has a few music notes that look like an A, 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 a F, you know, la, la, la. So he's now expressing it, whether he wrote it down, he sing it to the arranger, whatever it is, he has expressed the song. So now people can say, if anything happened, they could look and say, hey, boy, I like this song, this is, this is a nice idea. Like, you let Aaron done sing that already. Aaron done writing the copyright already. You lie, boy, but I had a single time. Well, I never hear you sing it. I get Aaron sing it. I never hear you sing it. You all get the idea. His idea was expressed to someone in some way. And so therefore now he owns the copyright. He owns the rights in the creation. In this case, we're dealing with um, musical creation. Because I know there are a number of you who are, are composers as well. I mean, you, you play with play for pan, play with pan, do pan, everything like that. Some of you all are, are soloists. Some of you all have your own original music, right? So you all are the composers of those pieces of music. If you're writing lyrics for the music, you're also you're also the author if at any time I, I miss anything someone let me know okay. the creation right it's expressed it is now fixed or expressed and therefore um copyright exists according to the burn convention which is a convention that was done of course in burn in uh i think it's that's switzerland in 1886 Right, and this Berne Convention is an international convention for all countries, so that you know um, the same idea I've expressed to you about fixing your song is the same all across the world. All across the world, once you express your creation, you own the copyright in the creation. All right, you wanna go good so far? <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Moving on. What does that mean that you have exclusive rights? Well. You know the word exclusive, it means it, it, it belongs to you, it belongs to that person to whom it's exclusive, it's exclusive right. So only you can give the permission to do certain things with that song. So you have the right, if you create a song, you have the right to perform the song or for the song to be performed by someone else. You know, sometimes songwriters, they will go and try and pitch their song to an artist. You know, most of these composers are very bright and stuff, but they're not good in front of a crowd. You might want to give this song to someone who has some charisma, you know, probably better looking um, like Dion, not, not like me, you know? So like me, I will have to write a song to give to Dion because if Dion go in front of a stage, she look mash up. If I go in front of the stage, it's bottle. So I would write a song and say, here, Dion, I've written this song. I am the composer, the author. I own this song. I'm giving it to you to sing. And she will be the performer, the artist. That's the name everyone calls. And this is one practice that I would like to start to change. It will take a while. Whenever we speak about copyright, we like to speak about the artist. 
Yes, the artist has an important role. They are the performers of the work, of the musical works, of the compositions. Not all the time they will be the writers. Understand? Not every song you hear someone sing means that they wrote the song. It is good to have composer um, performers, performers who compose their own music and stuff. But there are a lot of songs written by a lot of our like them, and that is the truth. So when we refer to copyright, we, we, we refer to composers and authors. Of course, I work at the copyright organization. We prefer, we refer to people who write lyrics as authors and people who write melodies as composers, right? But they are all within copyright. Another name for, for copyright is called author's rights. Okay, you can always ask me questions about this in um, when it's, when that time comes. Let's move on. I'm having a very short presentation here, right? So yes, as I was saying, what rights does the person? What exclusive rights do they have? So the first one I, I showed you was performing right. The right for the song to be performed, for you to perform the song once it's performed, and perform the song don't, don't really mean even the artist. If the artist records it in the studio and they have a song recorded and that song recording is played by a DJ or on a radio station or in a restaurant or a bar. All of those actions are performed. And once your work is performed publicly, then you deserve to get whatever is due to you for the public performance of that song. That's the basics there. That's the basics. So one of the rights, performing rights. There's another right called translation rights. CMOs don't really take care of that right. That's something that's usually done between the writer. Sometimes I think publisher get involved and so, but it's the right to perform the song or for the song to be translated by someone else in another country. So you have a hit song like Dollar. And who composed that song? Your Colin Lucas. For someone in France, I think there's a French version of Dollar. I think so. But that is translation, right? So they are singing a song in French. Right? So that's translation, right? Let's get to the rights that we would do with here. Aha. Uh -huh. Mechanical rights. Sometimes I speak with people and they talk to me about mechanical rights and they don't have a clue. And that's fine. I don't make them feel silly. Mechanical rights is a broad, 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 broad right. What mechanical rights really um, reproduction of a musical work, reproduction. In fact, anything you do, any public performance of the work, there. Has, there is a bit of reproduction before you perform it, you know. If a radio station has to perform a song, has to play a song over their, their, their radio frequency or television frequency, they have to take a copy of the song first. Put it in their system to play. If a, um, a DJ is playing a song, the same thing, he has to get a copy, whether he takes it off of um, YouTube or whether you give them a flash drive for the song and so forth and so on. So mechanical right deals with the, 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 the reproduction of the work. Now, back in the days, you used to have something called CD. I do not know who here remembers CD besides the panel. I do not know if anybody remember what a CD looks like. Well, for, we'll set it about PK Cast. Who have gone to Soros living in the backyard? Who know about a track and the AT and stuff? None of you all. But I will tell you something about mechanical rights. If someone takes you, likes your song and they want to reproduce it onto their CD or whatever have you, then they have to get a license, a mechanical right license to do so. They can't just do so just so, especially if they are doing it for monetary gain. So someone taking your song and reproducing it. Um, some people like to use your song in um, 
even in ads or, or beside in on put it on bill or you know use your song somewhere else and they reproduce it they have to adhere to that right and it's different to public performance so you get the mechanical right first you get the permission to take a copy and then when you get a copy you play it and then you have to pay a right a public performance um right for that we will expand on that at a later date i just want to give you the basics on it because we have to get into the, the meaty stuff okay all right so this is what i was talking about with um the right to receive royalties if a uh, entity uses a song in a movie a documentary a short film an advertisement uh for further DVD manufacturing any kind of audio visual medium av means audio visual right any type of audio visual media all right and that specifically is specifically called synchronization rights which is under mechanical rights because you are reproducing but it's just that synchronization normally refers to audio visual product so like cds um a low video on demand and anything to do with audio visual animation and and you know i don't want to go too deep but um i don't want to go into publishing too much but usually copyright organizations take care of your public performance right the mechanical and the synchronization is usually called publishing and it's usually done by a publisher at cut we also grant we also ask people to assign the rights we can take care of their mechanicals and their synchronizations for them if they do not have an external publisher so let's put a, let's give an example uh mr cameo yes how are you going good okay nice you have a nice song your daughter did called blessed land we want to use it we have a little movie um uh, we want to use about um, about 40 seconds of that song, Blessed Land, in our movie. Oh, okay, wait till just a minute, just a minute. Um, could we talk to your publisher so, so that we can deal with the synchronization and stuff? Well, I already have no publisher. All my rights were cut. Wait, cut. Uh, okay, so so who can I speak to? So then the conversation starts. So we go to cut. Cut will say, okay, you will have their rates. Now, even with that going on, so and you, let's say that is clear and they pay cut, and then cut will now pay me at a later date when it's time for distribution. I will get my royalties, my synchronization royalties from cut. Now, with cut, if it's over a certain amount, I may get my royalties one time. All right, it all depends on what was negotiated for me and at times and cut will call me and say oh this is cut mr cameo um this company wanted to use um a song you wrote for your daughter blessed land you okay with that yes I am. okay we want to go with um a little 2005 that's a song all right okay well we'll look at the, um about 3000 2005 all right good and the deal goes on the deal happens and do you think that's all the royalties you get for your song? That's the synchronization rights? No, it's not. When that product, that audiovisual product is now shown to the public, when it goes out there to TV, radio, well, whatever it goes out to, uh, ABC network and so, then the broadcast royalties, which is broadcast, is a public performance over TV stations and radio stations. When that broadcast plays, you are now eligible for performance right royalties. So you see how the mechanical and synchronization, the recording part of it, it, it translates into the public performance part of it. And so there you can always get residual royalties for your music once it's been shipped out there and so. All right, write down your questions, get your pen and paper. I hope you have your, pa your pen and paper, Pantry and Bigo and Associates. I know you have a number of questions and we will try to answer them within the short 30 minutes we have after, right? 
Let's move on. So all of these are different rights that you have. There's also moral rights. Moral rights is a non-economic right, which means that you don't get royalties for, royal, from, from, for moral rights, but you have your moral right. If it is that you write a song, okay, let's, let's, be, um, let's be facetious here. Let's, be, let's say you um, use our All-Stars man. You write a song and you real All-Stars, eh? You're not into the Spurs at all. Yeah. All-Stars, you write a song and they want All-Stars to play your song. And so and so it is. It, it, so let me, in fact, let me, let me use that example. Let's, let's go to politics. Let's say I am a PNM, right? And I am a singer too, and I have a nice song. People know me as a singer. I'm, I'm in the political field with PNM. Election time. And on another organization, CNU. Let's say CNU is another political organization. And they now in their, elect, their election campaigning. And they take my song, me a PNM boy, take my song and use my song for their political campaign. Um, campaign without my permission, that is trouble. That's plenty trouble. You never ask permission, things like that. You have to ask permission. And then it's my moral right. It's the same thing as if you are a religious person and somebody is having a, a God forbid, a, sat a satanic party or something like that. And to advertise the, the Halloween party or so, they take you, your good, good Christian boy, you take your song to advertise the show. Spooky nice, woo, and, and your song playing in the background. That is um, abuse, that is, that is an infringement of your moral right. Other moral rights are, for example, the right to, to be credited. So if your song is being used um, in like a production, you have the right for your name to be listed in the credits and to be, um, accredited for a particular song that you have been used and so, so all these different rights here performing rights translation right adaptation right the right to adapt and, and adaptation right is used a lot in Trinidad because a lot of times people use song to advertise and they want to adapt the lyrics of the song so you know um let's say give me any song um everybody, um, everybody give praise, everybody give let's say high mass by David Rudder. And somebody, military take it now and talking about the inflation of prices. Look all the prices them raise, rise up in a face. They cannot do that without clearing the rights with the composer of the song, Mr. David Michael Rudder. Things like that. So you have. Look at this sheet again. We have performing rights, translation rights, adaptation rights, mechanical rights, synchronization rights, moral rights, and more. There are so many rights. And it is what it is is that particular organizations you can administer or assign certain rights to them. Not all, some. Some you maintain for yourself. Um, in fact, with CUT, and I can speak about CUT, I've been there 16 years, you could administer your performing right, your mechanical right, your synchronization right, all these things. You do not have to admit your mechanical right and synchronization rights to CUT. Definitely you have to assign your performing right so we could pick up for all performances, which we are uh, at our primary um, mission. You could assign your Synchronization rights and our mechanical rights to a publisher, a separate entity, call a publisher and they deal with that, all right? Because um, what another misconception that uh, people have is that with, if your assignment cut, cut the poster ship or the song to you, for you, for you, no. A publisher, a separate publisher, that is their role. They go out there and they look for whatever is going on in the world to say, hey, I have a catalog of songs here. And you could use any of these songs in your documentary, in your movie, in your bestseller, in your advertisement. That is the role of a true publisher. And that's what they do. So the true publishers go out there and they pick your music for you. Whereas Cut comes as, as an administrative publisher, which means we don't really have time to go out and pick your music for you. No, we don't. 
what can happen, somebody likes a song, they want to use it, they do not know where to go, they call Cut. And then Cut could now look up the work and say, yes, this work, um, the rights were assigned to us. All right, if we look and we say, okay, we see there's an external publisher, we will put you onto that external publisher. If the mechanical and synchronization rights are assigned to us, we will do the um, licensing on behalf of the songwriter. And as I said, we will collaborate with the songwriter to make sure that he or she gets the best price and so forth and so on. Lovely. I think I talk enough how to watch time here. It's, al it's already 6.30, only about 15 more minutes again. So the bottom line is that Aaron will now become a member of a music licensing body like Cut. And Cut will now be assigned some of his rights. And you can see here, you know, Aaron looking at you know, looking a little sharper. He has assigned his performing right, his mechanical right, his synchronization right to an organization. And that's it. So that's clear. So let me get some things clear now to, to you. Let me stop the screen share now. Right. And let me explain some things now. So with copyright, you do not necessarily need to join an organization to copyright your creations. There is a method now called the general form of copyright where you take, if it's sheet music, if it's a copy of the song, um, if it's the lyrics, whatever it is, you put it in an envelope, you go to the post and you mail it back to yourself, certified mail or registered mail. Mail it back to yourself, you get it, you do not open it, you keep that safe. It will have the seal on the, where, on, it will have the, um, the stamp on the seal, you don't open it, that is just to protect your work in the case of a court, court of law. That's the best way to fix your work, to get your copyright. You do not need to join any organization for copyright, you are protected by that. So if anybody takes your song or uses your music, anybody does that, you can now take them to a court of law and you could use that as evidence. The judge will see, and um, John, if I make any, any little mistake in your presentation, you can always clear up that for me, I, I think I'm right. Magistrates will now open that in a court of law. You will see the date where it's stamped. So anything happening, any infringement happening, it's supposed to be post that date. Post that date, in other words, after that date, right? Because there's no other way really, you can't go into anybody's mind and say, well, okay, no, you really wrote it before him or whatever it's like that. So you have to have some kind of physical evidence. And that is the best evidence in terms of copyright in your work. To so mail back the items yourself, registered mail, and to keep it, right? It's also known as a poor man's copyright, all right? So, um, and that was the name that people know it as, regularly know it as. Um, now, with that being done, to join organizations, everybody has their requirement. With cut, I can tell you, um, you could write, and this is, I'm, I'm just being frank, eh? if you allow me. You could write 10,000 songs. My name is Enrico, but I'm being frank right now. You could write 10,000 songs, and none of the songs that you have written are being publicly exploited, meaning not playing on radio, television, no one is performing it, no one is playing the song recording of it. Once your music is not being exploited out there, then cut is of no use to you and you are of no use to cut or to any CMO for a matter of fact, because it's all about pay per play. I want you to remember that term, pay per play. So if your music is being performed, it means that it, it has the ability to generate royalties, which means that you would be of use to us and we would be of use to you. It's a, that's the relationship, right? We have a lot of people in cuts, some, um, some of them, the distribution time they're complaining, but their songs are not playing. There's nothing we can do other than a, 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 a little contribution you get every year for just being a member. That's, that's what you can get. Again, something from a pool of money that might be collected. But in terms of your music being played, it's important. It's also important to help certain organizations especially in Trinidad and Tobago, 
on in smaller islands to where your music is being performed and you give us a log of your music so that we are able to get those logs and therefore with the license fees from those events generate royalties for you. There are a number of, um, how do I put this? There are a number of situations that may fail such. That like, for example, we, we have some other organizations that say they, rep they represent copyright. And I wouldn't say anything, you know, just to be um, impartial, but they do not represent your rights. And therefore you might say, by bringing all these logs for all these places and I am not getting the money that I think I deserve. Sometimes we have issues with people who are collecting pretending to be the organization and they are not the organization, yeah. all right? I'm not saying that they pocket any money, but who knows where the money goes. And so, so I don't want to go too much into that because that is, that is personal thing there as with certain organizations, but yes, let's continue with copyright. So questions with copyright. So now you understand once you write us, once you write a creation, you own the copyright for it. Now, if it's, a, for example, in Pan, you may write a song and, and um, the people like the song and they want to play it for various events. Might even want to play it for Panorama, right? So that song is now given to the arranger and they make an arrangement, a wonderful 10 minute arrangement of your musical composition. Now, now back in the days, we used to have something called Pan Tune. That was a big thing when I was growing up. So you would write a song specifically for Pan it would be sung by people who are known to sing pan tunes, like the late um, the Fausto, like Kitchener, um, people like you know the uh, composers, Calypsonians. They used to do these songs, whether they compose it themselves and sing it, or they get the compositions from some from other people. All right, and then um, a band picks it and they play it. Who gets the royalties for the performances? the composers of the songs. The composers of the songs get the copyright when those songs are being played. Not the band leader, not the arranger, not the players. The composer of the song, right? Um, and that's pretty basic. I think people understand that, but you know, it's just to get into that there. Now, we have a lot of young composers in many uh, parang sites, all right? who compose music, whether for their side or for themselves. They have a lot of um, single players as well. You can join an organization. Once you publicly perform your song, you could generate royalties for your songs being played. This is different to when a promoter pays you for a performance, right? We are making this very clear. I'm trying to explain this in layman's so Making this very clear. So if a promoter hires you, you play a list of songs, a whole repertoire. You, let's say about 12 songs, right? Your other performance. And let's say six of those 12 songs are songs that you composed. Then what happens if that event is paying um, the license to the right organization, that organization now will be able to generate royalties, not only for you, for your six songs, but for the other people, songs that you have performed. And that is something that happens a lot. We have a lot of people who perform a uh, nice repertoire and they only want to list their songs. No, you are supposed to list all the other songs that you perform. Those composers and authors deserve their royalties as well. And you played it in order to generate a performance fee given to you by a promoter, which is one-time money. But all the residual income developed by as composers and authors by the public performance of works need to be adhered to, right? So um, that's the basics on copyright. I want to spend the last five minutes because I only have five more minutes. I'm not going to um, measure on, on, on time at all. And I want to basically talk about neighboring rights. I should really could have a, a whole session for neighboring rights because this is now a new right. And <clears throat> it is important that we talk about this. Because people would have heard that there's an organization now charging double. And it's not that we not that the organization is charging double, it's just that now it's representing another right. So what has been known to represent for copyright, now we are representing for neighboring rights. Why? 
especially as neighboring rights has always been adhered to in the Copyright Act of Trinidad and Tobago, which means that at any point, some, anyone could administer neighboring rights. It doesn't belong to cut, it belongs to whoever has the right. And what has happened three years ago, CUT signed a memor memorandum of understanding with IFPI. Who is IFPI? That's a big organization that represents the major record labels in the world, Sony, um, Universal, whatever have you and so. So they signed this memorandum with Trinidad and Tobago because they recognize that Trinidad and Tobago plays a lot of foreign music. They recognize Trinidad and Tobago plays a lot of their song recordings, and they want to get the royalties for these song recordings, right? So right there, I'm confusing you. Song recordings, we were just talking about composers and authors. Well, let me tell you, a song, a full song, is a, it's a myriad of rights. So first, we know about copyright. We know about composer. We know about author. We even talk about publisher just now. But when that song is recorded, it's been recorded by producers and by performers or artists, as you see. But we are talking about that performance. We are talking about that performance by the performer in the studio. It's just like when Luther Vandross put down a wonderful rendition and, you, and that now is etched onto that song recording for life. And every time you hear that, it, it, it touches you or Patti LaBelle or whoever it is. That recording in that studio, that is the performance of the voice. So that is performer. And then of course the producer is the one who produces the song track. So now you have a sound recording, something that could be heard, something that could be played on radio or played by DJs, played in your store, played on your phone, played from Spotify or iTunes or so, right? This is the right that producers and performer that have been fighting for for years, right? And which is why they have been trying to get into copyright because they have not been getting their piece of the pie, so they say. Well, now they are. Because as IFPI I has signed that MOU for us to collect royalties on their song recordings for the international repertoire, we have decided in thinking about our society to include we're collecting for neighboring rights for foreign. Why not collect for local? Hmm? Why not collect for local? So now we have, and a number of producers and performers have signed on and cut for neighboring rights. So now it doesn't only represent composers and authors and publishers, cut now also represents performers and producers. Let me explain what I mean by performer. We are not talking about the live performer, somebody getting um, playing on playing live, being hired by a promoter. We're talking about someone doing a recording, someone recording their creation um, on a, 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 a song recording and that being part of that. So that when that song recording plays now, not only now can you generate copyright royalties, you can now generate neighboring right royalties. Now, that particular neighboring right is called master rights. The rights in the master. So um, now we are able, so a performer, a band player, he, he could now create a song. Or even if he doesn't create a song, if he does a song recording, if he goes in studio and he plays, he does a cover of someone else's song, the copyright would belong to the original composers and authors, the original songwriters, but the rights in the song recording can belong to different people depending on what agreement is between the producer and the performer, depending on what the relationship is. If a performer is paying his money and saying, here, what producer, I'm paying you your full price and I want um, to own the rights of the master of the song recording, then that's what it is. There are times in the past when um, artists, and I know them very well, some of them I perform with, would have paid studios for tracks. They are the composers. They believe they own everything. And the producers tell them, no, nope, all you did was pay for my work for the time using my plugins and whatever have you and so on, so on, so on. You, didn't, you don't own the master rights. Uh -uh. 
And you know why that mistake happens sometimes? It's because when you don't do your business properly, sometimes you allow a song to get big. And then when a song gets big, nobody go and say, well, no, I don't want the master writing it. All of a sudden, percentage starts to flare up. Everything starts to go crazy. No, I have 50%. You, you, were you 15? No, you're here wrong. It's 50, I say. And things like that. It is very important to do, and this is the most important thing with, with, with your intellectual property for those who are either creating original music or doing pan covers of music, it's always important to do your homework and to make your agreement at the time of the recording. Not everybody take a drink or smoke and vibe nice in the studio and then five months after you're now looking to discuss who has sharing what, whether it be copyright, or the, the neighboring right in terms of the master right. These things are important. We can't talk about everything right now. My time is up, but I hope you got a little briefing about copyright and neighboring rights. These are the two rights we spoke about in the intellectual property module, which is my expertise. And I hope that you have those questions there for me and I hope I can answer them in the due course time. It has been an honor and a privilege for me to represent for me with the Music Mansion my, my, my company to represent as someone who has been in the business for 16 years in terms of intellectual property. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you for that mouthful that you had there. It's, it's, a, it's a lot to digest. I, I myself have a lot of notes written here and some questions yes. that will be coming. Uh, but of course, I just want to remind you all those live on the Facebook and those live in the room here with us right now, once you're listening and you have questions, take your notes. We will get to that point. You can write your questions in the chat or you can then raise your hand after and we will take care of that. So without holding it back any further, let me introduce to you, Dion McNichol Stevenson. Dion, you can take it away. Hi everyone, thanks again. Um, thanks um, Enrico for that very enlightening sharing. Um, I'm sure that people have questions and we look forward to answering your questions afterwards. I will just begin to share my screen now so that I can go through my presentation. Is everyone seeing the screen? Okay. All right, so we spoke a bit about um, copyright and related rights. Um, and you know, I just wanted to kind of recap what we would be covering today based on, on um, our discussions with Pantrin Bigo. So we're talking about intellectual property, which we've started. We'll be speaking a little bit about branding, a little bit about contracts. And then I always like to end it off with an action point. Um, what is our responsibility now that we have this information, right? So, um, where is my... Stop. Right. So we spoke about copyright and related rights. We spoke about, um, well, related rights and neighboring rights, they're used interchangeably, right? Um, and you could give us a good, a good um, starting point there. In intellectual property, we also, we will also discuss as it relates to steel pan, patterns, industrial design, and trademarks. These are other elements of intellectual, other forms of intellectual property that can be utilized um, in, in protecting the output of our steel pan industry, right? Um, but they are not copyright and related rights, patents, industrial design, and trademarks are not the only existing in the, um, intellectual properties. There's also ge geographical indications and traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. I would also like to state here that um, your know-how, your ability to, the way in which you do things, the way in which, let's say, in, in the pan context, let's say tuning a pan, for instance, that know-how can also be considered intellectual property because it is a creation of the mind. Um, and that can also be protected by way of trade secrets, right? So that's another kind of form of intellectual property that exists. It could also fall because of how the steel pan came into being. Um, things like um, skills such as tuning or even creating a, a, a steel pan can possibly be captured as traditional knowledge 
that being knowledge that is passed down from generation to generation, right? So it may also reside in our national um, repertoire of traditional knowledge. So we'll start off with a pattern. Um, this image here is an image of the Phi Pan, right? P um, percussive hum hum harmonic instrument, right? Um, and what is a patent? A patent is an exclusive right which is granted for an invention, which is a product or process that either provides a new way of doing something or offers a new technical solution to a problem, right? So if we look at this in the context of our steel pan, we would have had our originating steel pans, right? Um, and then it would, it, they would have morphed there would have been new inventions, right? We would have invented a guitar pan, we would have invented the cello pan, we would have invented double tenors, we would have uh, invented the six bass, the eight bass, etc. right? But not, not all of those inventions um, sought the intellectual property protection through patent registration, right? So a patent basically gives you some exclusive rights, right? Um, it provides protection for the invention, which prevents others from manufacturing it, using it, or trading it. I'm sure some of us remember that a time when there was a, a lot of discussion about um, a potential patent registration in the US for our original steel pan, right? Um, thankfully, that patent um, is, is, is not active, right? There would have been questions, it would have been opposed and eventually it expired, right? Um, so a patent provides you with a typical time of protection, duration of protection is 20 years. So it provides you with, let's say a 20 year lead on your competition, right? It gives inven inventors the incentive um, in the form of recognition, right? And the opportunity for fair economic rewards through exclusivity, because you are the only person who has the right to produce that particular invention, to export that particular invention, or to allow others to um, export it, right? So it is a right that you can um, give on to others, extend on to others. You can give your consent for them to use it, or you could use it and use the, that, that particular exclusive patent right um, to, to, to produce things in on your own or you can license others to produce it right um a patent also provides a spur onto others who uh who want to use the product protective technology that means that they would have to find other solutions to the problem um that is solved by a particular patent which redounds to the benefit of all of us because um we have all um benefited from increases um, in technology, which would lead to different patent, um, patent um, protection, right? Or patent registrations. So for instance, we may have, let's use a pen for instance, right? Um, we start when, when, you know, pipe writing started off, it was, you know, with the quills and you see them with the little feathers and dipping into ink, ink etc. Then we had cartridge pens, we had fountain pens, we had ballpoint pens, we have felted pens, all, all of those, all that progression along the technology um, has patents behind it as well, right? And so the fact that somebody had a patent on the, on the fountain pen cause somebody to be able to re-engineer and think around the, the problem to come up with a cartridge pen. Okay, so I want ink, but I don't want to have to be dipping into ink well all the time. So, you know, I'll put it into this little plastic thing and put it into the pen, et cetera, et cetera, right? So patterns allow for us to be able to solve problems and it allows for us to be able to use those patterns now as part of our business strategy. So this is intellectual property, and I, I can't stress the point enough that intellectual property is as important a property as your real property, as in your land, or any of any other of your assets, right? Your cars, your machinery, etc. Your intellectual property is, in fact, an asset which can be used to bolster the business that you do right within the steel pan industry.
right? Still bang in the music industry, right? So patterns can become part of your business strategy. Um, patterns in relation to Trinidad and Tobago law, there's a, there is the Patent Act of Trinidad and Tobago, and so um, the registration process, what has to be included in, in the registry, in the application for patent, um, the process for the, for the registration, et cetera, all of that is laid out in that Patent Act. Okay, so a next form of intellectual property is industrial design. And this is uh, this image here is an image of Pan 2000's Pan case, right? Um, I'm informed that Pan 2000 actually has several industrial designs registered, be it their Pan cases or their Pan sticks, right? Some of you may be familiar with it. And an industrial design is where the ornamental aspect of a useful article is protected, right? So it doesn't speak to the function, but it speaks to what it looks like, right? If we think about our iPhone, if we think about um, a KitchenAid appliance, um, those are, those are um, examples of industrial design. So the, the, look, the look of the, of the, of the um, instrument, the look of the product, is actually protected, right? So this ornamental aspect may be constituted by elements which are three-dimensional, such as with this case, so the shape of the article, or two-dimensional, so lines, designs, patterns, and colors. So let's say, for instance, um, hmm, what, what is an industrial design in terms of pattern that I could speak to? Perhaps Burberry, I don't know if you all know that brand. It basically is a, is a type of, um, tan tan red and black plaid pattern um, that may be protected by industrial design right um, but it's not um for the industrial design is not dictated solely or essentially by the technical or the functional considerations so it doesn't matter what the what the apparatus does what matters with industrial design is how it looks right but of course the most um, profitable industrial designs are those where the look and the functionality, the form and the function of the, of the instrument of the product um, matches seamlessly. Again, I will draw reference to your iPhone or KitchenAid appliances or even um, Dyson vacuum cleaners. So why do you want to have an industrial design? Well, the owner of the registered industrial design also has a right to prevent third parties from making, selling, or importing articles um, that either look like the protected design or are a substantial copy of the design um, when those acts are, are undertaken for commercial purposes. So you design a particular pan stick and you register it for an industrial design and in Trinidad and Tobago and in most territories, um, industrial designs have, have a formal um, requirement of registration as well as patents, right? So, and again, there, there is an industrial design act of, of, of Trinidad and Tobago that um, lays out all the legal requirements for this registration, right? And industrial designs, again, can also become part of your business strategy, right? So you, let's say you have a, a, a slate of uh, um, different, different types of pan sticks that you have industrial design registrations for, right? And you are entering, let's say, into a concession agreement with uh, uh, um, uh, maybe a store or a, a department store perhaps that sells, you know, musical instruments, right? Or with a music source, right? You can license them the right to be a sole distributor of these particular pan sticks or a distributor if, even if not sole even if not an exclusive distributor you can license them um, to be an, a distributor of these pans that carry this particular industrial design right um, it, it, it basically and we'll touch on this when we speak about branding um, 
it increases, let's say, the value of what um, of, of the asset that you're bringing to the table, right? So again, this can be used as part of your business strategy. And then there's trademarks, right? Um, so trademarks are signs that distinguish goods or services produced or provided by an individual or a company in a market. I was not able to um, put in a pan-related trademark because I'm not aware of any trademarks that are, that are registered by um, steel bands or even by Pantry and Bagel. I omitted to ask, and, and, and perhaps this could be my question for the question and answer segment, whether Pantry and Bagel's um, logo is actually registered as a trademark right um so what a trademark does is it allows your consumers to re to be able to distinguish your good and yours or your service from someone else so popular trademarks that we would know and I'm, i'll go with clothing here or, or footwear we know nike or nike if you want to call it that we know adidas right we know puma right and so those marks when we see it will either cause us to purchase something or cause us not to purchase it because with the trademark be, um, comes a, um, an expectation right of the quality of the particular good or the quality of the particular service right so your trademark is very very important in doing business and why do you want to have a trademark? Well, because it ensures that the owners of the marks have the exclusive right and you all are recognizing by now a pattern, a pattern. With the patent, with the industrial design and with the trademark, there comes, as well as the copyright, there comes an exclusive right or exclusive rights, right? For the products or the services, right? So a trademark ensures that the owner of marks have the exclusive right to use them to identify goods or services or to authorize others to use them in return for payment. It also hinders the efforts of unfair competitors, such as counterfeiters, um, to use similar distinctive signs to market inferior or different products or services. So you have gone through the trouble and the expense of investing in registering a trademark to put on all your um, steel pan merchandise right um and you recognize that there's somebody who is um using a sign similar to it but not exactly the same right and they're pushing out inferior products or services that is something that you would have to jump on as a trademark owner right to prevent those those um inferior goods from going onto the market and being associated with your good or service, right? Which would then of course have the, the potential to reduce, you know, the view of your, your goods or service in, in the eyes of consumers because they've gotten this inferior thing that looks like yours, right? So protecting your trademark is extremely important. You monitor that and protect it, right? And so trademarks as well can become part of your business strategy. Now, we spoke about very little about, just introductory, very, very introductory about patents. We spoke about trademarks. We spoke about industrial designs, right? And we're seeing that all these, as well as your copyrights, in terms of all these four elements of intellectual property can be used in your branding, right? And what exactly is branding? Branding refers to deliberate actions that you take to influence people's perception of your product or service so that they will choose your brand time and time again, right? Essentially, it is the way that your product or service lives in the hearts and minds of your consumer. So your brand, the brand that you put out there is what causes people to love you or hate you. The brand that you put out there is what causes people to move from being consumers to consumers, right? where they, they actually join in promoting what you do, promoting your good, promoting your service, right? Because of your branding. And when we think about Steel Pan, the Steel Pan fraternity, um, it has happened almost organically in that um, 
part of the, the brand identity of a steel band um, is not just in the way, um, not, not just their logos or their names, but also we can see it in, we can hear it in the way they play. So certain bands have a particular sound, right? In the way that they, we've come to, um, the type of arrangements we've come to expect from them, right? And then of course the merchandising that they put out, i.e. their, their t-shirts, their hats, their polos, cups, whatever um, useful, um, material, whether it's a t-shirt, a cup, a plate, whatever that you can put a logo on that's basically look, looked at as merchandising, right? Um, so your branding goes through all those areas, right? So your brand, your branding is impacted by the design of your logo. It's impacted by the identity, um, that you attribute, let's say, to your band, to your logo. What is the culture um, within the steel band? Um, how are they recognized locally? How, they rec how are they recognized internationally, right? All of these go into your brand. And again, as you see this word here, strategy. Again, it is part of your business strategy. Branding is part of your business strategy that takes into account all the intellectual property assets that you have, right? So it's not divorced at all. They, 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 if they're not married, they're in a very close relationship, right? The intellectual property um, as an asset and branding, right? They, they tend to go hand in hand. Okay, so we've spoken, we've spoken a good bit about how we, I was supposed to start my stopwatch and I didn't. Hmm. Okay. Marcus, you may have to keep me on time. Or oh, Lauren. Um, so we spoke about the intellectual property. We spoke a bit about branding and, and, and what that looks like. Right? Now let's see how we can apply it to contracts as it relates to steel pan. So some, some elementary things here. Your contract is made up of an offer, an acceptance, an intention to create legal obligations and consideration, right? So you need those at least, those four things to say that you have a contract. And I want to stress the point that contracts can be oral as in verbal, we, you know, my word and your word, you know, we shake hands on it, or it can be written. But let's take a wild guess of which one is easier to enforce if it comes to the point of having to go to a third party, i.e. a court, to be enforced, the written one. Because when it comes down to oral contracts, it's my word against yours. It's whether I misunderstood or misheard what you said. Like when Rico was talking um about the synchronization deal or about yeah the, the deal you're speaking you said fifteen thousand you said fifty and I heard fifteen right so to be safe we always want to make sure that our contracts are written and I know that we tend to run from the written contract but please it 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 will save you stress right and another reason why your contracts, especially in related to your intellectual property, should be written is because intellectual property are intangible assets, right? It's not something necessarily that we can hold and feel, right? They are intangible assets and it makes, it makes for a lot uh, more clarity, right? When you can actually read and examine the terms of a contract, right? As you're about to execute it. So for a contract to be legally binding, there must be, as I said, the offer, which is um, the unequivocal terms upon which, um, uh, well, of the offer. So for instance, um, and again, well, let's try to keep it in the steel pan context. Um, I am offering you as a promoter, 
the opportunity to perform at my event for your seal band to perform at my event on the 4th of August for $20,000 where you have to play for an hour, right? So that's the offer. The offer is I need your steel band to play, to perform for one hour on the 4th of August and I'm paying you 20,000, right? The acceptance is a mirrored reflection accepting all the terms of the offer. So my accept or your acceptance then would be, okay, my band will play at your event on the 4th of August for an hour and, you, and we will receive the payment of $20,000, right? So the offer and the acceptance have to be mirror reflections of, of one another. If your acceptance is not reflective of your offer, but, but introduces new terms, right? Then that is actually a counter offer, which now must be accepted, right? And then we come to intention to create legal relations. What do we mean by that? Intention to create legal relations is basically we, both the offerer and the, and the offeree or the offerer and the person who is accepting, they both intend to be bound, right? By, by the terms of what they, they are agreeing to, by the terms of the offer and by the terms of their acceptance. They intend that this is a legally binding transaction. It is not, um, let's say in a, a familial or a family setting where, you know, maybe I ask you for $20 as my father and you say here, and I say, thanks, right? There's no intention to create legal relations there, right? And again, this is why it's important to put things in writing because it's not impossible to have a contract with your family, but it, 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 is, um, it is not the usual um, circumstance. So the law has required specifically in, uh, um, as it relates to family, when you're dealing with family members that it must be specifically noted that you intended to create legal relations, right? But that is that goes across the board for all contracts. That intention, that intention to be legally bound must be there. And then there's something called consideration. What is consideration? Consideration in this context is not, hmm, let me think about it. No. Consideration in this context is actually the promise for the promise. It's a mutual exchange, right? So to use the example um, of, of, of me offering your band to play, the consideration in that, in that um, example would be the $20,000. So in exchange for your band playing at my event, which is a value to me, right? Because it will, in, it will increase the viability of my event. My consideration for that is the $20,000. Your consideration for again your consideration for going through the trouble of getting your band ready outfitted transported and present at the event um and and playing the consideration is also the twenty thousand dollars right so that was the exchange right twenty thousand dollars for me to play right i'm getting value as the promoter for, for you playing and you are getting value through the twenty thousand dollars right so consideration is the exchange for the exchange, right? The promise for the promise, right? The mutual exchange or the promise for the promise. Then we have the capacity to contract. Now, where this comes in specifically when we're dealing with minors and or persons who do not have their full mental capacity. They're not fully sane or they're not fully mentally able, right? So persons who are minors, they do not have the capacity or the ability to contract. And persons who have diminished mental capacity also don't have the capacity to contract. Does it mean that you cannot enter into a contract with them? No. What it means is that they must be, there must be a representative, right? That is entering into the contract on behalf of this minor in the, so, or, or in behalf of this mentally diminished person. So most times in, 
on behalf of the minor, it's either a parent or legal guardian, mental capacity, any, any legal representative, right, can enter into the contract on their behalf. Then we want to make sure that there's an absence of vitiating factors. What does that mean? What that means is you want to make sure when you're entering into a contract that nobody is putting a gun to your head. Nobody is forcing you, right? Because someone forcing you to enter into the contract would actually affect your mental capacity to contract at that particular time. It will affect your ability to make, make a, a, a choice, right? So there can't be any duress, there can't be any undue influence when you're entering into a contract. If those factors are found to be there, then that contract can be voided or, right? Um, it, it, it will not, it will be null and void, right? It wouldn't be able to be enforced. And then the objective of the contract must be legal and possible, right? And <laughs> I mean, for it to be legally binding, right? So the objective of the contract, therefore, can't be for me to kill somebody because that's not a legal thing. Murder is not legal. The objective of the contract can't be for me to bring a unicorn to be the mascot for your next panorama appearance because unicorns, as far as we are aware, are fictional characters, right? So it would not be possible for me to bring a, 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 a unicorn to be your mascot. So I can't contract for that, right? And so these are the things that we have to look at when we're entering contracts. Now, if we think about it, we enter into contracts all the time. Sometimes we don't, don't, we are not even aware, right? Now, remember I said before that contracts can be oral or they can be written, right? And so how do we, how do we determine an oral contract? We look at these very same um, elements here. Has there been an offer? Was there an acceptance? Was there the intention to create legal relations? Was there some sort of consideration? Did they have the capacity to contract? Was there an absence of vitiating factors? And can the, is, is the objective of the contract realizable? These things can happen by our performance. So let's take this, this session for an example, right? A question was asked, an offer was made to Enrico and I by Pantry and Bagel representatives to be part of this webinar. They wanted us to speak on these topics that we're speaking on. We accepted, right? We said, yes, we'll be part of the webinar. We'll, 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 we'll talk on the, the subject matters and that you've asked us to speak on. Was there an intention to create legal relations? Yes, because we, we both intended, both the Pantry and Bago um, representatives and Enrico and myself intended to be bound to what we would have said, right? So let's say um, Pantry and Bago went ahead based on our acceptance to advertise and, you know, um, promote the webinar. Um, and one of us decided, let me use me decided, I'm not sure enough now, then I've actually broken the contract, right? Because the, the acceptance that I gave was to be present at the webinar, right? So, and, and I intended to be bound when I was making, when I made that acceptance, as well as Pantry and Bigo intended to be bound as well, because they are having the webinar, right? Consideration, what is the value that is exchanged? Well, we won't talk business on this platform, right? <laughs> but let's say the consideration was realized, right? We both, we all have capacity to contract. We're all of, of, of the age of majority and we're all, you know, more or less <laughs> in our good minds, right? We, we have full mental capacity, right? There's no gun to anybody's head. 
There was no, I'm going to hold your child hostage if you don't do it. And we're not contracting for something that is impossible to be done or illegal to be done. However, there was no writing, right? But the actions of Enrico and myself and, and, and the representatives of Pancho and Bego, Marcus, Laura, and others um, have demonstrated the offer, the acceptance, the intention to create legal relations and the consideration, right? So you can have a contract, a contract can exist without it being in writing. So I want you all to be very, very, very particular about how you engage um, in acting with one another, right? Because you may be entering into contracts that you are not putting into writing. But if you're entering into a contract, you must know that you're entering into a contract, right? When you step into a taxi and you pay the taxi driver, the taxi fare, that's a contract. It's not written anywhere. But it's a contract. You can see by the performance, he is offering to take you to your plate, to your to your destination for a particular fare. You are accepting that he will take you to that destination for for the payment of that fare. Once you pay that fare, right? Um, and so I want us to just have that in mind when we're thinking about contracts. But leave with those four things: contract equal offer, acceptance, intention to create legal relations consideration. Once we have age, once we're not mad, once it's possible, we have a contract, right? Good. So how can contracts be used in relation to Stupan? So some of you may have membership contracts with your band. So I don't know if you, when you became a member of the band, whether you signed a contract, um, and maybe even for the management of the bands, there might be contract. I know that some bands, let's say, have, um, sponsors right um there would be a sponsorship agreement that would speak to how the band would be managed or how the band would would uh, um obtain sponsorship right there may be a membership agreement for you to be part of punch and bagel as a, as a sponsored band as an unsponsored band etc right so that's one one element of contracts being used in in c -Pan. the other is for performances right Enrico spoke to, 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 to that a bit, right? So you may be contracted as an individual pan player or as part of a band to perform, whether it is to perform live or whether it is to, to, to perform in a recorded sense. So they, they're recording a, a track and they want to pan on it and they bring you in, right? Or they're making a recording of, of, of seal pan playing an entire band, right? And so contracts are used for that as well or should be used for that as well and then when we're dealing with licensing of intellectual property which is how we intend to commercialize and monetize our, our intellectual property agreements contracts are also, also used right so you might recognize i'm using contracts and agreements interchangeably right a contract is an agreement agreement is a contract in in this context right so the intellectual property that you have, the trademark, the industrial design, the patent, the copyright. These are all um, either transferred or assigned using contracts. And I would have to, I, I also should state very categorically that in Trinidad and Tobago, copyright cannot be assigned unless it is in writing and signed by both parties, right? So once you're assigning your copyright, let's say it's a copyright management organization, a collective management organization such as CUT, there's a, there's a contract that you will sign, right? It has to be in writing and it will be signed by you and it will be signed by CUT. If you are licensing, um, let's say um, All Stars is licensing Women on the Base, their, their arrangement and recording of a woman, um, woman on the Base, to let's say a film, right? To be used for their synchronize, the synchronization right to be employed. Then that is also done via an agree, a contract, right? So we can see how our intellectual property can be used to, 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 to monetize, right? Um, our situation, right? 
Um, and so then when we, we've said all of this, but then what is our responsibility, right? What do we do with all this information that we have now? Right? Apart from probably looking for some more information, right? We want to be able to identify and protect our intellectual property. So you might be the manager of a band, you might be the arranger for a band, you might be a pan tuner, you might be a soloist. Take the time to look at what you have in terms of your creative expressions and identify what intellectual property you may have. You may find that you have a thousand songs written. You may have that you have a thousand songs arranged you may find that you have this idea that um, to, 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 I don't know, improve some elements of the pan, of, of seal pan, or, um, you know, a different design for how the, the, um, the band should be configured, you know, to, to adjust for the sound and the tonal quality, etc. You may have a trade secret in, in the sense of this is how I tune you know, this is how I get this particular sound or, 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 you know, or whatever, right? Those are all elements of intellectual property. You need to take some time and identify them. Once you've identified them, then you also can protect them. Because when you know what you have, then you can do something with it. You can identify, okay, so this, this mark that I've been using you know, to represent the band all the while, this is actually, can actually be protected as a trademark. Okay, so let me look to seek to register my trademark. Or this thought that I've had about, you know, improving this particular function um, or designing a new pan stick. You know, maybe I could get a patent on industrial design on this. Okay, let me, in, let me investigate that, right? And I would also take this moment to plug for the Intellectual Property Office at Trinidad and Tobago. They've been very, very helpful um, for our creatives in terms of getting us up to speed on, on intellectual property and protecting our intellectual property. And so, so I say, don't, don't, be, um, don't be a stranger to them. You know, take the time and definitely um, communicate with them, right? They're on Facebook, they're on Instagram, um, they have a website. So you can definitely be um, communicating with them in terms of any additional information you may need. And of course, you can feel free to reach out to myself and Enrico as well, right? So our next responsibility, once, we, once we've identified and, put, and taken the steps to protect our intellectual property, we want to be able to monetize our intellectual property using contracts. We don't want word of mouth. We want things written down, right? Um, I think we kind of, we, we, we've suffered long enough, um, in, in terms of as a creative industry, as a cultural industry, um, for the sake of things not being written, right? Um, we, we, we have to have that paper trail of our intangible assets and where they're at, right? And when you do enter into a contract, um, there's something something that I advise all my clients to do is something that is called contract management. So in the same way that you have project management, where you know you have all these steps to take in relation to getting a, pro a project completed, you can do the same for your contracts. It can be as simple as an Excel sheet um, with dates and um, items to be um, dealt with. So for instance, again, to use the example of me, um, hiring a band for an event that I'm having, that contract will have several things in it. It will speak to the date, it will speak to the date of the event, it'll speak to the venue, it'll speak to um, what kind of marketing is being done for the event, it'll speak to the payment, it'll speak to whether I have to be flown in and whether I have to be accommodated, etc. or the band rather has to be accommodated. So all those elements of the contracts, all those active terms, right? All those terms in the contract that have a corresponding action or date can be plugged into an Excel sheet. So you can diarize, right? And remind yourself of when things are happening and when things should happen by, right? 
Um, so if, and in that way, manage your contract, right? And then you want to monitor and enforce the intellectual property rights that you do have. So you, you've registered your trademark, you've registered your patent, you've registered an, an industrial design, and you've taken these steps to ensure that your copyright is expressed and unprotected. Then you want to monitor where it's being used. And when you see infringements, so persons using your copyrighted material without your consent, people using your trademark without your consent, people importing the industrial design or something that is a real close copy to it or infringing on your patent rights, you want to enforce them. You want to familiarize yourself with what you can do in each instance of infringement of that into that form of intellectual property and go after the person because passiveness will redound to the minimizing or the watering down of the value of your intellectual property now value of intellectual property is something for a whole other webinar right or two right um but it is something that um again the ipo and other organizations are discussing with financial institutions in the sense of how do we um bridge that gap where creatives have lots of property in the sense of intellectual property but how do we put a value to that and then allow that value to be used as collateral for financing entrepreneurial um interests right how do you how do you use our intellectual property as as collateral as strong as you know land and and you know homes and motor vehicles etc right in a way that still allows the creator to be able to monetize the intellectual property right and therefore be able to to, to finance whatever loans or whatever they may be taking right and so um, another thing that I wanted to point out in terms of our work of, of um, copyright protection, World Intellectual Property, which is WIPO, also now has a facility called WIPO Proof, right? I'll put it in the chat when I stop sharing the screen. That's called WIPO Proof, where you can actually um, digitally submit um your creative expression so if you've written a song if you've designed a program etc you can um submit that deposit it with wipo proof and you will get a digital um certificate right of of being the creator and the owner of that particular um intellectual property of that right of that particular copyright so that's something that can be useful to us right even alongside the poor man's copyright that um and you could speak about so that's it for me right now um and i think now what we will do is open up for your questions and answers um yes. is lauren there or um, marcus do we have any questions any hold on I think they're there. We already have one question from Facebook that I, I got here privately that was asked to answer. Uh, the question is, are you all hearing me? Yes. Okay, beautiful. The question is, oh, I'm looking at the, the wrong association. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> the question is, um, if you fail to register your song with Cut and your song was in a documentary or performed live, would you be able to register the song after and receive royalties after the fact? Good question. So there are times when a song has been exploited and we would either get logs or um, from the party or we would get logs ourselves, like we, we also monitor the radio stations and, and um, television stations, and a song will not be registered. What happens is that um, the pool of money is collected, the license fees collected for whatever that exploitation was, 
if there's a record of your song and it's it, it identified as an unknown, unknown meaning that it's not yet registered in the organization, then it basically goes into a, um, a uh, what do you, oh my goodness, I deal with this so regularly and I'm just forgetting the name of, of it, but it's basically an account where your money is held for uh, a pay account, it's called, pending investigation account. It's held in an account there for a period of time, allowing you the opportunity to register your song. I mean, it, it's more work for the, the staff at CUT because at every distribution, we now have to go into that PI account, pending investigation account, to now match the music there or the logs there against the now documented work so that those who did not get the royalties in a particular distribution will definitely get it on a further distribution. It's possible, but it's not forever. I think um, there's a period, I'm not sure if it's three years or three months, I can never remember the period. But yes, it's not as if, if a distribution period passes that that's the end all. You have an opportunity to still register your work and get royalties only at a later distribution date. Well, I hope that answered the question sufficiently for someone um, or for the person that asked. I'm seeing that Akinola, San, hi Akinola, is saying that there should be a special revisitation of copyright process regards panorama songs. The process is really diverse and stands out to other existing scenarios. You're quite right, um, yes. Akinola, in that, well, basically what a, what a panorama song is, is, is a derivative work. Now, um, what is a derivative work? A derivative work is a work that exists and attracts its own copyright, but it, it is derived from an existing um, copyrighted work. Copyrighted work yeah? yes. So the song, which will then become a song recording, or in most times becomes a sound recording, right? So those are two points of copyright there, right? <laughs> then, be, then is now arranged and adapt it to a certain extent to create a new copyright work, which is the performance and sound recording of that, that performance by the band, that arrangement as played by the band. So there are different levels, different levels definitely in relation to the copyright in a, in a panorama song. So there are questions as well um, I say, you know, who is the who is the owner, etc. Right. Um, so our Copyright Act speaks to producers. Um, and when it speaks to producers outside of the neighboring rights, um, it speaks to um, the person that makes the financial arrangements for things to happen. So that tends to point many times to the executive producer, right? As the um, as the owner of, of, of the copyright of that master. So it, it is different. Um, it, is, it is different for um, Steve Pan. Steve, um, for, yeah. Hi, um, Akinola. Yeah, I, I saw that your hand is raised. So do you want to comment or ask a further question? You Hello, Diana. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Yes. Um, another thing is within a panorama song, a panorama song in itself can be subdivided into so many other compositional material then. Like for example, in one panorama piece, there's opportunity to derive, I would say probably sometimes about 20 different um, compositions that can be used on the, for, on the commercial market. And I think, um, you know, creating that diverse, you know, copyright kind of understanding of the panorama type music, it kind of also gives way to, you know, for producers and composers to start looking into panorama music in that kind of context, in that kind of way, you know, creating a whole other revenue stream for the steel band, for the steel band arranger, 
and, and that kind of thing. I mean, I heard you mention woman on the base. I mean, we could, a producer, like we say, some producer in the States could look at woman on the base and start subdividing so much of elements from within that and coming up with compositional material, whether for film, whether to use as advertisement, whether to use yes. as an actual song, as an actual track, you know? Yes. So um, I think the revisitation of how we look at copywriting Panama music would give way, or would open the door rather to so many other diverse um, scenarios. Thanks. Yes. That's, Allow that's me to say something on that. Thing. Go ahead, Enrico. Yes. Mr. Sena, how are you, sir? I love your point. Um, I had a because I had a little issue. I always used to ask, okay, so you decided to do a particular song, an arrangement of a, a existing song for Panorama. And what? So then when royalties from Panorama is being paid, is it only the original composers of the song that would get the royalties for the public performance by the band? Which it should not be because you now have this arrangement and rightfully so. You see what you've said there? You have not only the original melody and concept, which is normally played um, in the first two or three minutes, well, or sometimes you play it twice and then you go into your various um, flows, you know, segues into different motifs and stuff, change key, major to minor, whatever have you. A lot of a lot of the 10 minutes being used is a lot of creative input that's been put into there. So I am all for, and it's something we could talk about, all for. You have your original song that you're using, but when you come to that particular arrangement, because that arrangement is handy change, eh? when you have that arrangement, whether you win on the night or, or not, people play the arrangement, especially if they make a finals with it, and in various shows and so. So that particular collaborative effort should have not only, yes, you pay homage to the original composers and authors, but it should, it should also have all the people who contributed in there, which most of the time would be the arrangers and so. Now, if it is recorded, the executive producer, there's another executive producer. So therefore, you have to you understand how far this thing can go. You have the original song recorded. You have one set of people owning the rights in that recording. And then the pan arrangement, um, that's a different song recording. So you have another set of people owning the rights there. Oh, by the way, that's so, and somebody had asked me privately, um, you heard me talk about neighboring rights, but I didn't speak about related rights, and they only heard me mention mm -hmm. related rights. They're the same thing. Related rights and neighboring rights is the same thing. It all means is, all it means is that um, related rights is related to, or neighboring rights is a neighbor to copyright. It's not copyright, but you need copyright, and then it's right to, to, to think yeah, they could exec exactly, exactly, exactly. So that's an excellent point too. We thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I, I can't endorse enough that that point, and that is exactly what I was getting to, in 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 saying, let us examine what we have and identify what what intellectual as um, property we have, because you rightly, as you rightly said, there can be many, very many derivatives from one arrangement. And it's nothing that is um, strange to the music industry because I'm sure we would have all had experiences of, experiences of hearing different versions of a particular song. Yes. You may have, you know, the original version, then one that's done with a, a Spanish flavor. I'm not talking about changing the language now, but just a different, a different mix, a different treatment, a different arrangement, right? Um, so it's been done before, right? Um, and certainly it is something that we can do with, with our steel band music. I'm seeing another question here from Melina Moffat. Hi, Melina. Um, she's asking, in the case of steel bands, if an arranger does a piece of music for a band, is he or she required to register himself as an individual or do they fall under a band registration? I have a question in relation to that before answering, Melina. Are you, when you speak about register are you speaking about registering with pantry and Bago? are you speaking about registering the work um with a collective management organization which registration are you speaking about 
Melina, if you could um, unmute yourself and, and explain. Lauren, could you allow Melina to unmute herself? Yes, I have given her the permission. I'm just waiting for her. Okay, thank you. Malena, you can unmute really? yourself. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was asking because, so that's the question basically. If it's that arrangers have to register under Pancho Bigo for those neighboring rights, or is it that a steel ban now could register and then the arrangers that, uh, let's say there's a contract between the arranger and the ban, and okay, I'm contracted to arrange. So you are being contracted. Am I now registering myself or is it under the ban? Or when is it that everybody has yeah. to be registered under Pension Bego? Well, Pension Bego could probably answer in terms of registration of, 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 of arrangements with them. But if you're speaking about registering in terms of collective management organizations, then you can register yourself as a composer because what you're doing is composing music as the arranger. Okay. But in terms of Pancho and Bigo, I would allow Pancho and Bigo to answer that. I can't, I can't see how that works internally with them. Um, what I will do um, in the bit of silence, I will answer you another question, uh, Ms. Moffett, you asked also, uh, can a ban even register as um, as Dion said, I do not know, I'm, I'm sure bands are members of the of Pantry Big Organization, but in terms of collective management organizations, you do not register bands. It's all about who owns the various rights, okay? Because as you know, a band could make and it could break. A band could be made up and, and break up. And if, if a band is, a band is, a band doesn't create a song, Members in the band can create a song. Members in the band can be composers and authors and producers and performers, right? Um, in terms of the copyright, it would be the people who write the song. So even if the band, it, 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 it this band, it, you know, or people go their ways and stuff, if the song is still being performed, publicly performed or being exploited for copyright, the writers of those songs could still get their copyrights, even if they join another band. So CMOs, as what we, what we call CMOs, collective management organizations, CMOs do not register bands, if it's intellectual property you're talking about. Only individuals, mm -hmm. right? You could have, um, uh, I'm not thinking in terms of performance, well, in performance you could have a, a band that performed on a song recording, but even in that, I'm sure it, it, it would, eventually go towards the single performers on that song recording. Um, in terms of um, a band, like the Spurs or like, like, like Panel Does or, you know, um, any band performing on a song recording, there must be an arrangement with the fan side and, and, and the executive producer. I'm sure there will be an arrangement there, whether it is he pays them or not, or they're doing something for the thing, whatever it is. But all of those things need to be in writing, as Dion said previously and keeps on reiterating. Okay. Um, I'm seeing another question from Josanne Felix. Hi, Josanne. Is there a mechanism in place in Trinidad and Tobago for the authorities to track every single time your song is played via all platforms, radio, streaming, etc., and for the <laughs> songwriters, producers, musicians, singers, etc., to be compensated accordingly? I think this is a good segue into um, TTISRC. <laughs> well, that's good. It's so many ways. Uh, this 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 question is so packed. It's like a it's like a hamburger with onions and tomatoes and you know, lettuce and of course you know your meat and stuff. All right, let's 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 talk about song recording. Yes, each song recording, you can have a special code called ISRC, which is your International Standard Recording Code. It's like, you know, when you register a song, and remember, you could write a song, that song could have its original song recording, 
and people could do a remix of it or they could be a pan version of it. That same song could have a number of, 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 of song recordings. So a number of song recordings that emanated from that one copyrighted song. And each song recording has to have its own ISRC. Now in um, what has been named the National Agency for your ISRC. It doesn't mean that you have to join CUT as a neighboring right member to become an ISRC registrant. You can become, you can get your, if you if it is you only write in song recordings, you are a master right owner, you can get that from CUT, you can apply for it. If it is that you want CUT to monitor your song recordings for you in Trinidad and Tobago, then you could apply to become a master right owner and then we will give you the facility to upload your song recordings onto a system we call Vericast. Vericast is a system organized by the Barcelona um, Audio Music Technology Group, right? Basically, to sum it up, it is possible to monitor every single song on radio stations. They have set it up for Trinidad and Tobago with us, where we could we monitor every single song on every radio station and five television channels that CT, TV6, CNC3, and two stations on, um, on, on the cable, the cable um, system, which is um, because of the local content, which is Synergy and Gael. And we're looking to do a few more. The thing is with that, the main question you have asked, so there's a the mechanism to track every single song. However, we still will go with the sampling process, all right? To, to uh, track every single song is a process called full consensus, which we are not yet ready for. Because I will tell you frankly, what we are collecting in terms of royalties from our broadcasters, and we're talking firstly about traditional radio and TV here. What we are collecting, if we were to go full consensus, then, each song would be probably you'll get a value of less than one cent per song. So yes, everybody will get a 45 cents or the, the, the $2 or the $17 or so. Um, and you'll find most of the music, most of the, the royalties for the music going outside because if you look at the, the, the three radio stations that we have, only a few would play local music regularly. Most of them will be the international repertoires. They're not gonna get much for your song recordings there. Um, and as I say, we go full consensus with what is being paid, all right? That's it, because we publish it. We, you know, in terms of broadcast, I think we, we generate over about uh, a million or two million, um, thousand, two, one million or two million TT dollars. But when you check how many songs are played by each radio station daily, multiplied by the week and by the month and by the year, you're not going to get much value for it, which is why cut and most societies around the world, they would institute what is called sampling dates certain date. So we take logs from certain date. If your song is regularly played, played, then it would fall into, it's most likely would fall into the sample date, into the, the sample logs that we, 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 we get to generate, than if a song is played once or twice. So sometimes somebody will say, my song played three times on the radio. It may not fall any sample date and you may not get any broadcast royalties for it, as opposed to a song that is playing regularly. With respect to streaming, with respect to the Facebook um, and the online uh, Instagram and 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 um, iTunes and Spotify, and so we are now working not by ourselves but with other organizations around the Caribbean. In fact, we are part of a, a group called ACCS, which is the Association of Caribbean Copyright Societies in terms of getting those bundle of rights for online to be able to um, do online. We do not do online right now, which is why if you become a master rights owner of CUT, it is not in conflict with the various digital distribution deals that you have presently. I, see, I think I talk enough there. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that answers your question. Um, it did for me. Um, so we have a few more questions. Um, I'm just going to take some that have come off of the Facebook. Um, one from Fantastic is asking, so does TNT have any patterns on any part of the steel pan? 
And what I can say is that we have two patterns that I'm aware of. Um, that is for the G-Pan and for the Phi, which is um, the, the image that I had in, in the slide there. They are both held by Brian Copeland and company, and I believe have been assigned to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So um, those patterns do exist. Another thing I should say about patterns, just um, for our understanding of why the first steel plan was, would not have been patent, protected by a patent or is not at this stage protected by a patent. Um, the, the key to a patent being applied is that it is the information or the know-how or the process is not part of the public is not part of the public domain it's not information that is known publicly and therefore if you're seeking to register a patent despite how excited you may feel about your invention um you have to be quiet about it until it reach, reaches the applica application process once it reaches the application process um you would be required to um fill out detailed claims that to describe what the invention does and how it works. And that is published and becomes part um, of, of what we call prior art, right? In, in, part, in the patent rule, part of what becomes the existing knowledge on that particular um, area, right? So um, because our steel pan was the original, would have been out and in the world and, and being um, copied, for want of a better term, and manufactured elsewhere, um, it would not have been possible to have a, a trademark for that particular pan, right? For that new one. Yeah. Um, another question come came from Richard Zen O'Brien, asking how would patents works? How would patents work with apps in a general sense? Yeah. Well, in the same way that it would work with anything. Once it once the process. Um, behind the application was is capable of being registered given the criteria for registration that is included in the patents act then it can be it, it would be um protected by pat, by patents however the expression of the app idea um you writing it out um the drawings of how it will go you, you know kind of storyboarding basically how the app will work that can attract copyright protection. So before you go to the patent process, what you should do is, you know, just type out what your app is, the con, the, well, the concept, how it works, etc. Because the concept and the idea are very close, right? And an idea cannot be protected, but the expression, right? So once we express how that app is supposed to function, then that can attract copyright protection, and you can use wiper proof. Let me um. I, I said I will find that link and send it to you all, the wiper proof. Um, yes, very good. <laughs> good. So that you could you could use that to to, to have a digital um a, a digital certificate generated by the World Intellectual Property Organization yes, by WIPO. Mm -hmm. to support your claim for ownership of copyright. You right, want to make so, sure and take a copy of that before the, you leave Zoom yes, because the Zoom closes on the Yes. Right, I've just put it in the chat. Let's okay. see if we can answer because it's almost eight o'clock. Oh, it's almost eight, eight o'clock. I will answer one very, very, very quickly. Sure. Somebody asked, um, I, I believe there's more than one on the Zoom. There are more than one corporate organization. TNT. It doesn't matter where I go. The fact is, yes, it does matter. Uh, you have to look for an organization that gives you transparency, an organization that has the relationships with the various other societies in the world so that not only we pay them, they can pay us for you. You also have to see which is the one that not finished. No, and I can't say that. But you have to see, make sure that your, your, your organization is, 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 is valid and, and can represent you in terms of you know, copyright, not only Trinidad and Tobago, but, but, but across the world. I can tell you that CUT has over 95% of the uh, membership in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, over 4,000 people, that is, um, over 40,000 songs, most of the songs uh, there. I cannot speak of the other organizations. I know they are there, right? I know we could represent because we have bilateral and reciprocal agreements with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, SOCAN, P 
PRS, AMRO, uh, SODRAC, uh, you know, all in um, France, Germany, Spain, South Africa, so forth and so on. And um, the, the, the thing is, you want also to be able to ask questions and to get answers for the royalties you're getting. You want to have a proper system and not just an ad hoc system. You know, you're complaining, you know, royalties and somebody stick a, a, a $1,000 in your pocket and, and you're happy and you go your way. You know, I'm not saying that that's what the organization, other organizations does. I'm just saying that you don't want that. And I know the organization that cut, you will not be, be, be getting that kind of, you know, you'll be getting better service. We have our issues, yes. And because we are the, the, the leaders, we do have issues. Um, however, it is a better organization to go with. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't mean for that to be a plug. <laughs> endorse, endorse, because the reciprocal as well, when we're talking about, um, you know, having our international um, representation, the reciprocal agreements with the international um, organizations and even regional organizations is very important. So I, I, I endorse that, that response. Just want to get to two questions very quickly before we run out of time. Anthony McAllister is saying that he's the recent author of a teaching tool for the tenor pan in ebook format. How nice. do I go about protecting my copyright? Same thing that we said. You type it out. Ooh, did we mention a copyright legend? No, we didn't. Right. So I think when you were speaking about the poor man's copyright, you did mention a copyright legend. So that is the year. Right, you see in a circle, that's a copyright um, symbol. symbol. Right? Mm -hmm. The year of year on and dates of creation, the name of the creator, the owner of the copyright, and all rights reserved. Right, so that's the copyright legend. So what you can do, Anthony, is on the um, the cover page of of uh, the text. Right for your for your ebook, you put the copyright legend there. You can also include it at the back. Anytime you're sharing the document, you also include that on it. I would generally um, advise my clients to ensure that on anything that they own the copyright on, the copyright legend is a footer on any text, whether it's digital or whether it's printed. Of, of their creation. That is what I was now going to ask you, Dion. If, if they put it on every page in the footer. You can, you so can put it in case. front and back, but it is it is safer to put it on every page. Yes. So that, you know. You Mr. know Macaulay says it will be copyright. So like see in any circle, see 2000, the circle. Like, say 2021, Anthony Max, Max, Max Aristotle. 2021, um, Anthony Max. All rights reserved. Limited or whatever is, is the, whoever would hold the copyright. Yeah. Right, because um, it could belong to your company, although you've written it, you could assign your copyright to your company, etc. Right, um, and then um, also there was a question as to metadata that I think was from Kareem, um, and whether there's a place for that. Yes, certainly, in terms of um, doing our branding and our marketing strategies and so forth, metadata becomes very, very important. The metadata yeah. is basically information about information, right? And so like when you're browsing YouTube, you know, um, you would see information basically um, after, uh, under a video or whatever. So the, the, the type of information that you put in there can make it easier for persons to find your your music to find you your product or your service right so metadata in the sense of that information about information that is included in in your social real estate your digital real estate so your youtube pages um when you're sending out your your, your songs um on on um, online distribution platforms etc as much metadata as you can put in there that drives people back to you and to your product and to your service is is um important yes and um, and to be obvious with that there are some programs when you are doing your masters they ask for the ishrc any metadata as well you can yes. put in your isrc code in them a lot of them uh, a lot of the digital distribution um as you all will know when you put up your song they sometimes want to generate an isrc for you with a us um thing instead of the tt if you have your own, if you are in an ISRC registrant, 
you can forfeit that and tell them that I have my own ISRC code and enforce your code onto your song file. If you are a registrant, do not make the Americas and the other people or the, 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 the labels enforce their own auto-generated ISRC on your song recordings. Yes. Make sure to use the ISRC codes because that's what's going to be um, enable us to, to track it. Anthony is asking, is saying that he's included all that info, I guess, so the, the, the copyright legend on the second page of the ebook. Is that all that is required? Um, what I would say, Anthony, is um, while that may be sufficient, I would also go the extra length of doing the poor man's copyright. So mailing by sending my registered mail a, a, a package of, of, of the ebook to myself and keeping it um, unopened as well as using the WIPO proof. So you submit that entire thing to WIPO proof um, and they will submit you with, a, an, a, with an electronic certificate um, of proof, right? Um, there was something else, right? Is she, hmm, Miss, I don't even know if it's that male or female, Arjun. Is it's Sean. It's Sean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sean Arjun is asking, if my band hires a graphic artist to design a local logo, is there a law in Trinidad and Tobago which gives rights to the graphic person to oh. make a claim to the said logo? Easy question. Brilliant question. Easy, but I love it. That is copyright. The graphic is um, an artistic creation, right? Um, and so it qualifies for protection as a copyrighted work this is where again the contracts come in and come in handy and by contracts i mean written contracts right so your band should have a contract with the graphic artist that while engaging him to do the graphics also has within there an assignment clause whereby he assigns, he or she assigns the, uh, the um, copyright in the graphic work to you, the band owner, or the band manager, right? Or the band, right? Because the band can be incorporated, let's say, as a limited liability company or non-profit organization, right? Um, so yes, the graphic artist does have a right to the logo. So if you don't do the correct thing, you can find yourself down a very brown um, creek once you start to broadcast that logo, etc. And he says, hey, I didn't give you permission to use that in that particular way, right? So for instance, one um, example I can give is a, a, someone would have created a, a graphic for a particular use, let's say for a book, and then the book um, was, uh, let's say COVID happened. And they decided, you know what, I'm going to upload my book online because they're not going to school anymore. So I will just put it online. But the graphic artist didn't give you permission to use the logo, to use that graphic work in an online um, environment. What he gave it to you was for printed use. And so you have to be very specific with the rights that are being assigned, right? Because you can't just reproduce somebody's work without their, somebody's copyrighted work without their permission. Is Sean, I see that your hand is up. Did you want to clarify or comment? Yeah, just quickly, even if the person is paid for the logo, how even does that work? Paid, even if they're paid. Because the payment for the service is one thing, but the assignment of the right is another. So you have to be, you, you, you have to be um, clear about what exactly it is you're, you're doing. And so for instance, um, how I advise most of my clients in this, in this area is that you, you get an assignment that gives you the right to use the, the, the graphic work in any way that you de deem fit, but you also give them the right, which would be um, In, in, in impacting on their moral right. You give them the right to use that logo, let's say in their portfolio, right? 
so that a graphic artist, let's say at the end of the day, would be able to say, here is my portfolio of logos that I have designed. I have designed logos for Cut, I've designed logos for Punch and Bago, I've designed logos for um, Creative TT, I've designed logos for XYZ, and that gives a certain amount of value and credibility to the, the graphic artist, right? So that allows him to build up his own inventory without actually owning the logos, right? Because you really want to be able to be free to do what you want, free to operate with the logo um, once it has been designed. So once you are hiring a graphic artist, again, you have a contract that engages him or her. This is what I'm, I'm engaging you to do. This is the price that I'm paying you to do it. This is the timeline that I need you to deliver by. And this is the assignment that I need you to sign so that my company organization or I have the right to deal with my logo in any way I see fit. You've been paid. You've designed the logo. You've gotten your, your exchange, your, your mutual benefit, and I've gotten my benefit. Yeah? Well, for the sake of being a devil's advocate in this, um, is there any way that the client could buy out the rights from the logo designer? Um, Thinking that yeah, what we can use this how we want when we want and so and if uh, is that possible? Just to be the it, it is. It's negotiable. This yeah. is the other thing with intellectual <laughs> property. Yeah. When you are when you are um, commercial commercializing it, it's negotiable. So if the graphic artist is aware of his value, he is going to insist on a buyout price yes. for the work. Right. Otherwise, I'm just giving you this assignment and any other use you want. If you don't include it in this assignment, I'm giving you. You'll have to come back to me for a further assignment. Yes. Yeah? So if right. I assign it to you to use in text and printed matter, and you want to now use it on a, on on your website in an online environment, you now have to come back to me. Yes. Right? You've had cases like that in cut with people, especially with photographers. Definitely. Photographers own the right in their photographs because they're putting it in a certain space and time. Uh, it is they are taking. It's not the subject that's being taken who owns the copyright. It is the yeah. person it's taking that particular. So you know, company, they have companies who they could have it on their site and stuff, but when they use it outside, the, the photographer wants to sue them on the right, and they would win because it's all about what you just spoke about. What is the agreement you have with with that person in terms of licensing? or buy out. Yeah, right? Um, yeah, so even if they were paid, tricks, tricks, tips, tricks theory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so I think, um, I think we've covered all the questions that we've gotten so far. And you know, I just wanna say again, thanks to Pantry and Bagel for hosting this webinar. Um, I think it is always, well, it, it is my mission for those of you that, that don't know me, it is my mission to demystify the creative industry. Um, and in particular, how we can use intellectual property as an asset in our arts and cultural enterprises. Um, so again, I would say, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm at Dion McNick on Instagram. Um, so you can you, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, you can find me on Facebook as well, Dion McNichol Stevenson. Um, always happy to answer any questions and try to you know illuminate um, any dark areas in in intellectual property or anything to do with the creative industries. So thanks again for the opportunity, and Enrico, thank you for being such a oh um, gosh as usual Dion you were <laughs> still on like fine wine I, I must say which is already already on its own geographical location but I've put in the chat any, any questions you want to ask me you can um send me an email at ekameho at cut.org.pt I'm only doing any emails now some of you know that I have different portfolios in the Trinidad and Tobago um I'm also on Facebook and as Rico DG um, my super key, um, Rico DG music on Instagram. But I would really prefer if you have questions about copyright, um, send it to me at ekameho, e 
E-C-A-M-E-J-O at cotcot.org.tt. I have an email for ISRC as well, but um, it will be too complicated now. So you can take this address and you could ask me all the questions and then I will answer you respectively. Anything you want to talk about, I'm open to the panel and to our members here. Thank you very much, Pan Bego. Thank you very much, Mr. Oh my gosh, so many people, Ms. Ms. Mitchell. Uh, oh my God, Mr. Ash. Uh, uh, oh gosh, everyone, everyone. Um, just thank you for having us here, and enjoy the rest of your month, your 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 pan month, still pan month. I'll be jamming with you somewhere, I'm sure. Once you <laughs> up a little bit. And happy still pan month, everybody. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Enrico. Um, as you can see, I started this point? in, in broad daylight. <laughs> and I've been on the road since this morning. I've, I've started at one location. When I came on to speak again, I was at another location. And before Gary catch up to me, I said, look, this webinar is going a little longer than planned. Let me get home here before. I know Dion is my legal advisor, but I really didn't want you to come and have to bail me out tonight, Dion. And, and I, I would really blame you. You had to do it on your own, <laughs> pro bono. This wrongs. So I would like to really, really, really thank you both, Dion and Enrico, for taking out your busy schedule. I know both of you have busy schedules, and you all are true friends of fun. I mean, Dion, the amount of work you did for me and assisted me legally in terms of with advice. Enrico, I mean, it, it, it was a pleasure having you all here. This conversation is not over. There were so many questions. Some probably would not have been answered. And, um, and, and we definitely will have to do a part two. We have to do a follow-up. Well, we know copyright. that long time ago. You could never have enough about copyright and all this information. I know, right? So... I want to tell everyone who has been part of this conversation to definitely share it. Share it with the Silban community. Get everyone into this conversation and where we are right now. Because we will have to do a part two. And we don't want to repeat. We want to continue. So if you can get in the loop and understand what we shared this evening and be able to take that and let us build from there going forward, we definitely can continue this conversation. There's a lot. I have learned a lot. I'm sure us at Pantrandego has learned a lot. We have been in communication in meetings with um, the copyright organization. I've had a lot of questions then. I've had even more now after tonight. Dion is always a phone call. Dion, the um, I need to help me understand this. And that's how it go. So really and truly, I can't thank you all both enough for what you did this evening. And I want to, before we leave, just remind everyone that we are in Steel, Band, Steel Pan Month. And this week is the educational week where we have a number of educational webinars and a number of activities. We have some events coming up. I want you to stay posted to our Facebook page, our Instagram page. Just follow, 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 because we have a lot of good stuff. If you really enjoy this program, this is just a drop in the bucket compared to what we have. We have the Pan Versus coming up on Friday and Saturday. I can't wait to see how that go. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Let me just say thank you to the uh, president of Pan Tribago, Mrs. Beverly Ramsey Moore, for her endorsement with the central executive, the fellow members of the events committee with myself. We have Siobhan Mitchell, who is the chair of that committee. Big up yourself, Siobhan, and to the rest of <laughs> members on that committee. And I am officially tired. So thank you very much. We are out. Lauren, over to you. Okay, well, we just like to thank everyone for being a part of our webinar, and we just want you to stay tuned to our Facebook pages, our YouTube pages, as we continue to celebrate Steel Pan Month. So thank you, everyone, and we hope that you have a safe night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Take care and be blessed. Long live Pan. <laughs> <laughs>